Well, welcome to the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery and to our new exhibit, Remarkable Red Deer. One thing that we're doing with the Remarkable Red Deer is, first of all, technologically, it's much more advanced than displays we've had before. It's very interactive. We're using technology to help uh, convey the messages of the history of our community. But more than that, what we're trying to do with the display is to give a more of a thematic approach to Red Deer's history. Not to just tell you what happened and when it happened and where it happened, but also to try and convey a message of why things happened. And also not just to end off at an arbitrary date of let's say the Second World War or the oil boom of the 1950s, but to try and give a sense of the rich, diverse history of this community from the very earliest days, but also to the current day because what we've done here today and what is happening right now in Red Deer, 20 years from now will be part of our history. So we need to have those elements here so people get a real sense of not only where we've been, but where we are today and some hint of where we think we might be going tomorrow. One of the things when people talk about history is we concentrate on sort of the settlement history when the first farms, the first house, the first businesses, but that actually overlooks literally millennia of history before that, when the first peoples came here, the hunter and gatherer lifestyle, and all that very rich history that has gone on for probably 8,000 years in this area. Unfortunately, there's not written records of it, there's not photographs, but there is archeological uh, evidence. There's also the stories of the past because there was the oral traditions of what happened. And try to convey a sense of that because it doesn't really help to talk about 100 years of history. The First Nations people that is well remembered is Mass Capitoon. Uh, peacemakers sometimes referred to as the Gandhi of the prairies. Uh, with the pressures that were happening to the First Nations of Central Alberta, he was a person that tried to create peace, to uh, create uh, a more stable coexistence at a time in which there was increasing fighting over shortages as the buffalo were disappearing and that. Tragically, he himself was killed in one of his peacemaking expeditions, but a man that is, has fortunately been remembered and uh, you know, we have a park in Red Deer, Mass Platoon Park, it's named in his honor. Also the Great Chief uh, Park is named in his honor. Uh, so we have had some remembrance of him, but also to better tell his story and interpretation here as part of the museum permanent exhibit. Of the general stories of Western Canada, considered a universal story, is the story of the homesteaders, the young families, the young adventuresome people that came out who for a $10 filing fee could get 160 acres of land to create a, a new farm, a new livelihood, a new home. But that actually isn't the story of Red Deer. We are unique in that this was an area where a land company, a colonization company, purchased 115,000 acres of land for $2 an acre from the federal government. And the idea was that this land company would bring a certain class, a certain type of settler to come to this area and develop the West that way. Uh, one of the first results was that uh, you had to have people with a little more resources because they were the people that could afford to pay five or ten dollars an acre to buy, get a farm as opposed to ten dollars for 160 acres. So a little bit more people with a little more means, maybe a little more education, a little more uh, uh, ability to uh, start a life where you had to start with a capital investment as opposed to just sweat, and equ sweat equity. But uh, another component of that was because there were all these attractive areas such as Innisfil, Lacombe, Pinocchio, Wetaskiw, and Olds, that you could get the homestead land, unlike Red Deer, that Red Deer developed a little bit later. Uh, we were a little bit slower. So when people say, well, I hear that uh, Innisfil and Lacombe used to be bigger than Red Deer, 
They're right, it was, because homesteaders and new settlers were attracted there first. It wasn't until later on that where a lot of the good homestead land was taken up that people began to consider moving to Red Deer and buying land. The company was called the Saskatchewan Land and Homestead Company. It was a financial disaster. It did not work out as intended, but it still had a major shape in terms of the community, just in terms of the speed at which this area developed, the kind of people that settled here, and the way that Red Deer developed. So we are not a typical Western Canadian homestead story here. We are the story of what does a community look like where most of the land in a community belongs to a absentee landlord and how that comes out. It's not an accident that at the end of Red Deer's Main Street, Raw Street, was the location of the train station because it's the main in and out access point to the whole community but also the communication center because uh, out of community communication was done by telegraph in those days. Communication in the early days was the telegram. Uh, it was a way of providing economical long-distance communication before we had um, cell phones. And One of the things when you have a museum is trying to appeal to all different ages and groups. And so what an adult might find fascinating looking at an old artifact and an old photograph might not connect for younger people. So we created a idea of a silhouette of a schoolhouse with the boys and girls entrances because in those days boys went in one door to school, girls went in another. But also to try and have toys, playthings, things that kids can use for their imagination. They have a historical root to it in terms of what they do, but something that is very active and very appealing to children because that really is, when we talk about making sure future generations appreciate something, this is one way to do it. One thing that's quite universal, still applies today as it did 100 years ago, a train set. There's something fascinating, particularly to little boys, of uh, having a model train set. Uh, this particular one belonged to Camille LaRouge and his brothers, Robert and Pierre. Coincidentally, Camille LaRouge worked for the CPR, and if you took the first letters of the LaRouge brothers, it was Camille, Pierre, and Robert, or CPR. So that was one thing that the train said CPR. It when didn't actually Red Deer first developed, there were a lot of general stores, maybe a bit of a specialty store in terms of a hardware or a harness and saddlery store. But there was a man by the name of uh, William E. Lord, W.E. Lord, uh, originally from Prince Edward Island, who brought in a concept that had really been pioneered by Timothy Eaton in Toronto and subsequently a national uh, uh, chain with it of a department store. In other words, all kinds of varieties of things sold in one store. It might be clothing, it might be appliances, it might be groceries. And that idea that you would go to each department in one store as opposed to going to different stores to buy various things. So quite a, quite a major shift. The other thing that Mr. Lord did is he didn't offer credit. He even had a motto that said it pays to pay cash at W.E. Lord's. And that was a very practical thing for him because a lot of promising early businesses went down because they'd extended a lot of credit. People just didn't have the money to pay their debts and then the business went under as well as the people that had bought from them. Mr. Lord, a lot of people said, well, he was stingy, he was miserly, he didn't give credit, but it also meant he survived. Eventually, though, because he built the successful business, that in the 1920s, when Eaton's decided to extend its national department store chain into Red Deer, that instead of starting from scratch and building a store, they bought out Mr. Lord, they took over his store, they rebranded as Eaton's, and then eventually took down his old buildings and created a new building on Gates Avenue, which is uh, the Century Place in downtown Red Deer. Critical thing about it is it helped make Red Deer a retail center, uh, a, a trade center for a wide swath of central Alberta. And with that, start with Mr. Lord and, and the Eaton's company, something that continues today because people come from a great distance to do their shopping in Red Deer. We're not just limited to the people in the city. 
there's probably twice as many people that come here from other communities to shop here. And so that key component of our economy goes back to W.E. Lord, the Timothy Eaton Company, and then a lot of other subsequent companies after that. One of the first big impacts of technology came in the realm of culture and entertainment. And one of the first marvels was the talking, well, first of all, the movie, and then starting with the silent movies and then followed by the talkies or the mu uh, movies with sound. And that was the first time that you had out of the community entertainment coming in, something people could go to. Uh, it might cost you a nickel, it might cost you a dime, but take in something. And it's something that really thrived. I think it shows how popular it was that even in the hard years, the early 1920s and the Great Depressions, movies thrived because for a relatively low cost, you could have an evening's entertainment. You could forget about what was happening in the quote unquote real world, real world outside of there and take in an evening and a social event and something that really was important to the community. So the old fashioned movie houses were real community centers. People in its heyday, pre-television days, you might go to a movie once a week, twice a week, whatever. You would certainly go a lot more perhaps than we go today. But I think even the fact that movie houses are still a component of our communities, they've changed in the way they are now. You know, you tend to have smaller theaters, not great big ones, and the way the special effects are played. But the idea of going out for a social event as much as an entertainment event, taking in a movie, having a night out, doing something different, seeing something you wouldn't otherwise see. One of a key element in most Western Canadian prairies was a restaurant, a place to go have a cup of coffee, uh, a place to meet your friends, a place to grab a quick inexpensive meal, uh, or having a community event, having a banquet or some kind of special celebration event. And Red Deer was the same. One of the iconic restaurants we had was the Club Cafe. Uh, its origins actually go back to 1916, but then in its current form, 1929. And what was also universal about it was almost every prairie town had its Chinese restaurant, a Chinese cafe, something run by Chinese Canadians, a place for a reliable meal, which you knew that you were going to get good service and good food at a very low price. And so Red Deer was very much part of it. The Club Cafe, close to the train station where a lot of people came to town, close to the highway as it came down Gates Avenue. So a good location and a lot of traffic. Ironically, the Club Cafe almost didn't survive because during the First World War, they got the contract to feed the soldiers who were training in Red Deer. And it literally almost bankrupt them. They thought they'd found Gold Mountain when they got this wonderful contract of all these people to feed, but they found out for, I think it was 35 cents a day that they guaranteed that they would feed each of the soldiers on. Those young men were eating about 50 cents worth a day worth of food. So it really very nearly wiped them out. So they went, uh, the, the owners, George Moon and Charlie Chuck, they left Red Deer, they tried Calgary, but they came back and started a newer cafe, uh, a little bit more community-based institution. And it really became iconic. A couple of the special features about the cafe that people remember was they had a parrot. Now parrots live a long time, you know, they can live well over a hundred years. They had a, a parrot that they nicknamed Peanuts because people were always trying to feed it peanuts. The unfortunate thing was during the Second World War when there were again a lot of military people in Red Deer, a lot of the soldiers and airmen taught the parrot to swear. So it kind of undermined a bit of the family atmosphere with this foul-mouthed parrot, but people said they were it. Another one was George Moon had been on a hunting trip in the 20s and shot a very big moose, a, a, a prized specimen. So they had the head stuffed and mounted on the wall. And again, people remembered the big moose head in the club cafe. And often you would find in the day that people would stick a toothpick or something like that in its mouth as a way of saying, yeah, you can get a good meal here. One of the critical things in uh, communities' history, and this is worldwide, is the impact of war. You know, we've had a few decades now of relative peace, so we don't necessarily really understand anymore, but Red Deer was greatly impacted by wars on several occasions. The first was the Boer or South African War at the turn of the last century. 
Uh, Red Deer was quite small, but a number of the young men from this community enlisted, went over, uh, four were killed. Three of them were with the Lord Strathcona Horse. And afterwards, Red Deer ended up with the first hospital between Calgary and Edmonton because Lord Strathcona, the Victorian Order of Nurses, and the community rallied to build a hospital as a monument to three of the young men who were killed in the South African War. So we ended up with a very valuable community service as a memorial to that sacrifice of period. The war that probably had the greatest impact on Red Deer was the First World War. Uh, ironically, when it started, people thought they it broke out in the August 1914, it would be over by Christmas. It lasted for four years. It was the first technology war in terms of heavy uh, modern munitions, weapons being used with devastating effect. Uh, in terms of Red Deer, uh, we were a community of about 3,000 with another 3,000 in the surrounding uh, rural areas. Of that, 800 to 850 young men enlisted to go overseas to fight. In other words, virtually anyone between the ages of 16 to about the ages 40 enlisted and served. Uh, the death rate was appalling. 118 lost their lives in service. Probably three times that number came out with some form of wound or other. And even the wounds were not always physical wounds. A lot of them were uh, uh, wounds to the mind. So one Ironically, although the First World War was often called the war to end all wars, it was such a horrific experience, people thought we would never have such a global conflict again. It happened. Within a generation, we had the Second World War. Actually, in many respects, the causes of the Second World War were strongly rooted in what had happened in the First World War. Uh, large numbers of young men and women enlisted in the Second World War to serve uh, about 1,100 in a community of, by that time, about 4,000. So again, most of the young people between the ages of, not as bad as the First World War where they were picking up young teenagers, but from about 18 to 40, many would have enlisted and gone to serve. But the impacts of the Second World War were not as quite as harsh on Red Deer as the First World War had been. Uh, much as it sometimes seemed that they had learned nothing from the First War, they did learn some things. So the economic disruptions were somewhat mitigated, the social disruptions. In terms of Red Deer, Red Deer was designated as a major training center in the Second World War. So at some points with the large A-20 Army Camp north of 55th Street where uh, Camille Collegiate is now and the Lindsay Thurber High School, uh, that uh, there was a large training camp there with about 1,800 people. You had two large air bases, training facilities, one at Penold, one at Bowdoin. And so at one point during the war, there were probably as many military personnel in and around Red Deer at the various training facilities as there were civilians. One of the big impacts was that uh, housing was incredibly short because some of these military personnel brought families with them. They might live in camp, but their families tried to live in some cases it was even converted garages nearby trying to uh, find a place to live. Uh, but also then there was the positive side. I mean, restaurants in Red Deer probably had their glory days because you always had continuous long lines of young military personnel looking for a meal, looking for a break. Uh, resorts like Sylvan Lake, huge numbers of soldiers. They might have had a day or two leave. You're not going to go on a big trip on that. So you'll go to something close by like Sylvan Lake to go, go to the dance halls, go to the uh, beach area, maybe stop by one of the restaurants or other places, uh, uh, refreshment places out there. So it really had quite a different impact. So war is horrible. We have 52 young men from Red Deer who were killed in the Second War. A lot of came back wounded, but not it was half of what the experience had been in the First World War in terms of casualties and losses of lives, and also more of an economic benefit with the major training bases here. One of the biggest influences on Red Deer over the decades has been what we now call Michener Center. Originally started in 1923 as a provincial training school, then later becoming uh, Deer Home and Alberta School Hospital, and now Michener Center. A lot of misunderstandings of what that was all about. It was the main institution in Alberta for the 
uh, care and housing of the mentally handicapped. Although a lot of who were there were not what we may perhaps would call mentally handicapped people. They, in some cases it was people with learning disabilities, such as dyslexia, or perhaps some physical problems and just not having another place for these people to be cared for or housed. But the key thing about it is that although it was a large institution, a lot of things were done there that we would not find acceptable today. They always had, it was called a provincial training school. There always was a heavy emphasis on education, vocational training, uh, life skill training, and also transferring into the community. Back in the 1940s, 1950s, quite a high rate of the residents there were transferred out into the community placements, finding some kind of employment or something along that line that the residents could try and reintegrate back into the general community. One of the things when we talk about Mitchner Centre, it was one of the most important aspects of Red Deer's community over the years, if for no other reason the huge impact it had on the community. At one time, if you took the number of residents who lived there, the number of staff, the people who work there, one out of every five people at various points in Red Deer's history worked and or lived at Michener Center, so a huge impact on the community. Actually, the origins of the uh, facility or the institution go back really to 1913, the same year Red Deer became a city. The original main building was constructed as the Alberta Ladies College. It was part of an initiative across Canada to create educational opportunities, particularly for young rural women. So they built one in Guelph, Ontario. It's now attached to the University of Guelph. Another one was built at uh, St. Anne uh, de Bellevue in Quebec. It's now attached to McGill University. And then the one for Western Canada was built in Red Deer and that was what they called the Alberta Ladies College. It was a very good opportunity. It created uh, a dormitory educational opportunities for young women who lived on a farm, didn't maybe even have a local school that went past grade eight for them to go to, so a chance to get uh, secondary and post-secondary education, so a really important thing. But the impact of the First World War was devastating. It, the, the, the school ran out of money, uh, they had a real struggle competing, and then a new need had arisen during the First World War with a large number of the soldiers coming home with wounds to their minds as, as well as to their bodies. It was purchased by the provincial government and turned into a, a soldier sanatorium, as they called it. Uh, in effect, a mental health facility for veterans who were suffering from what in those days they called shell shock. Uh, one thing about a lot of those veterans is the death rate amongst them was horrendous because they came back with shattered health as well as shattered minds. So a number of the veterans passed away in 1923, there was a reorganization. They consolidated the treatment for veterans at what's now called Alberta Hospital, Al Oliver. And so they converted then what had been the Soldiers Sanatorium, the Soldiers Treatment Center, into the Provincial Center for the Care of the Mentally Handicapped. Its original name was Provincial Training School for the heavy emphasis on training, vocational skills, basic learning skills, reading, writing that sort of thing, and also socialization skills. Uh, there was a huge demand in Alberta for a facility like that, something that started off with two or three hundred residents. At its peak, it was about 2,300 residents. So really a major institution. Some of the people that were there today, we would never even think about them as they, were, they might have had a, a learning disability that looks like they, they, they couldn't learn what they but they, they were very capable of learning. They just needed to have uh, remedial assistance so the learning to overcome the dyslexia or some other things that they had. So there were a variety, variety of things that, starting in the 70s, a real emphasis on moving people with mental handicaps and disabilities back into the community, more community center, group homes, living in their own homes,
living in other settings. So the institution declined greatly in terms of its uh, its size uh, and uh, the people that were there. But also a shift though too away from being a quote unquote institution to what they called Michener Services. The idea that it would be a center not just for residential and um, to some extent medical care for residents who had uh, disabilities but also uh, uh, physical or mental uh, issues beyond their, uh, their uh, learning disabilities. But, but there are also a wide variety of other services in terms of supports, to, uh, networking, uh, centers for research. The first Canadian program for nursing that specialized in the care and medical treatment of the mentally handicapped was initiated in Red Deer and a lot of groundbreaking work was done in terms of that kind of specialization in terms of nursing and medical care. So a very big part of, the, uh, of Red Deer's history, something which we have now been announced is scheduled to be closed. I guess we'll, that's in the future so we'll have to see what happens. But undeniable because it was the provincial institution for the care of the mentally handicapped uh, important part of Alberta's history, but in terms of Red Deer, you can't have something that has up to one-fifth of your population living there or working there and not have something that has a huge impact on the community. On a positive note, I'd like to think that one thing is because many of us who've lived in Red Deer all our lives, we, when you talk about people with mental disabilities or maybe even also physical disabilities, so that because we know them, we know them by name. I, I would hope that out of that is also a lot of it more acceptance, that you don't think of them as unusual, you don't think of them as something to be feared or shunned, that they're people you know, you get to know them as people. And I like to think that that's made Red Deer a more caring community because we know that there are people that have disadvantages but that they are still people and that they are our neighbors, that they are part of a community and they're people to be prized, that people to be friends with, people to work with, and all that benefit of not just sort of isolating them and thinking that they're parked over there and we don't have to think about that they are part of our community. And going back the entire history of the Provincial Training School, the Allied Deer Home, later Alberta School Hospital, and Michener Services, because it was such a big part of our community, because as residents were able to be discharged to live a more community-based life, that a good level of acceptance, which I hope is one of the hallmarks of when we think of Red Deer, not something negative. And sure, there were lots of things in the past that were not what we would do today or not considered acceptable anymore. But at the same time, a compassion, a, a caring, an acceptance, an understanding, which I hope is one of the things people also remember about Red Deer. One of the hallmarks of Red Deer, much as it has been in Canada as a whole and Alberta as a whole, in the last number of years, the enormous increase in diversity in our communities, that has always been an element. We, with the exception of the First Nations, the First Peoples, we are a society of people that have moved here from somewhere else. But in the last number of years, the diversity of the people who have moved here is really quite incredible. So when you look at Red Deer, there are the stereotypes as the quiet prairie town of one or two religions, uh, Christian reli branches of Christian religion, uh, of ra one or two racial groups and things like that. We have so many people from so many different religions, ethnic and racial backgrounds, literally from every point in the world. You can find people in Red Deer from the Falkland Islands, and I hard to think of a place more remote and as small as the Falkland Islands. But this incredible diversity and the richness that that brings to a community, the cosmopolitan aspect, the new points of view, the new uh, energies and outlooks of people that are coming here by choice, that are wanting to start new lives for themselves and their families and their friends and all the energy that that brings to a community and the acceptance and the understanding and the breakdown of old prejudices, 
is becoming one of the real hallmarks of Red Deer and something I think we are all very proud of.